I am Nick Deolius, and this is the Far Middle Podcast. And here comes the 4th of July. So here is the Far Middle Public Safety Announcement for the week. Don't mess with fireworks. But if you just can't help yourself, then please be careful because we need all of our constant listeners to first be able to hear the host and second, to be able to use all 10 digits on their hands. Fourth of July brings to mind all kinds of imagery for Americana, perhaps none bigger than baseball. So our sports dedication ties to baseball. But once again, we're going to make sure the dedication applies beyond the playing field and is takeaway value and insight for everyone. I think we got a great dedication subject that fits that bill. And he carries one of the greatest names in the history of far middle sports dedications. And we've had some doozies in the past, as you know. But how about this one? Kennesaw Mountain Landis. We made brief mention of Landis back in episode, what was it, 136, when we covered the now defunct Federal League of Professional Baseball. And we'll revisit the Landis role in that in a moment. But suffice to say that this week's dedication subject, as a judge, he sat over more interesting and impactful and, shall we say, unique judgments and cases than just about anybody else in the history of American jurisprudence. Kennesaw Mountain Landis, whether it be his career, his legacy, or his strengths and his flaws, which we're going to discuss, stretched way beyond the profession of baseball. Now, the first thing I will say about Kennesaw Mountain Landis, and I just learned this when doing the far middle research in preparation for this episode, that with a name like that, you know, you'd think the guy was a physically imposing giant, but not the case. Kennesaw Mountain Landis was five foot six inches tall, and he weighed maybe 130 pounds. Now, that surprised me since his name doesn't match the physical dimensions And I've seen photos of him, and he facially looks like a physically big man, if that makes any sense at all. But a journalist once uh, described Landis's face, I thought you'd enjoy this, as being, quote, the face of Andrew Jackson, three years dead, end quote. I might have to remember that one for future use when in need of a quick insult. So if the judge was not exactly what we would call an imposing physical figure, how did he get the name Kennesaw Mountain? Well, the far middle research team succeeded once again, running down the story behind the name. You see, it wasn't a nickname at all. The Landis family was from Cincinnati, and the judge's father served in the Union Army during the Civil War. He lost his leg in the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain in Georgia. And after the war, his dad decided to commemorate the loss of his leg by naming his son after the battle's location. Interesting. The uh, Judge Landis sort of story, when you look at his career, he fortuitously landed into a federal judgeship when he became, early in his career, a staffer for a secretary of state under then-President Grover Cleveland, and that set him up a few years later for that uh, federal judge appointment when Teddy Roosevelt was president in 1905. And then things really started to get rolling for Judge Landis. He was what we would today call an activist or celebrity judge. And it was a fairly common occurrence to see that on appeal, his decisions would be reversed and overturned, and he didn't seem to care. And he certainly didn't change his penchant for unique judgments. He charged Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany with murder after the sinking of the Lusitania because the casualty list included residents of Illinois, which fell within the judge's district. And in the speech, uh, Landis demanded that Kaiser Wilhelm, his six sons, and 5,000 German military leaders, quote, be lined up against the wall and shot down in justice to the world and to Germany, end quote. Yeah, Landis uh, went on. He fined Standard Oil, as in John D. Rockefeller, $29 million, which was an enormous sum back in the day for alleged antitrust va- uh, violations. And he presided over a spat concerning a libel suit between Henry Ford and the Chicago Tribune, which was a very high-profile case. Unfortunately, Landis also trampled over individual rights. As a classic liberal, I don't like that at all. He sentenced a congressman from Wisconsin to a 20-year prison sentence for having the nerve to criticize World War I or America's involvement in it in a newspaper editorial. And Landis went on record later saying he would rather have stood the congressman in front of a firing squad. 
I guess Judge Landis likes speaking of firing squads quite a bit. We've just seen two examples of that. Now, thankfully, the sentence was overturned once it got out of Landis's courtroom. He once presided over a trial of over 100 radical labor activists charged with tens of thousands of cumulative crimes. And Landis provided guidance to the jury so that the jury took less than 60 minutes to find every single defendant guilty. And if you add it all up, the sentences from that trial, they tabulated 800 plus years. Um, the labor activists, by the way, they were from the industrial workers of the world, which were nicknamed the Wobblies, and the uh, Landis judgment effectively squelched the overall uh, union effort with the Wobblies. But Landis is most known for where we referenced him back in episode 136 with the upstart Federal League of Professional Baseball when it challenged the business model of the American and National Leagues. Landis had an interesting maneuver in this instance. He used simple delay. And having the case languish in the court system eventually bled the Federal League of time and money. Now, fate intervened once again for Kennesaw Mountain in our dedication for episode 149, I believe, uh, back with the subject and the dedication being Arnold Rothstein, if you recall, uh, was the event that led to Landis's next career move. You see, that, of course, was when Rothstein was playing a key role in allegedly fixing the 1919 World Series when baseball saw the shambles that its reputation was in, it begged Landis to become the first ever commissioner to bring it respectability and standards. Landis agreed on one condition. He told uh, professional baseball that he would enjoy absolute power in his decision making and that owners would never question his judgments. Baseball ownership was so desperate, they agreed. And thus, Kennesaw Mountain Landis became the first ever commissioner of Major League Baseball in 1920. And by the way, the accused players for uh, Chicago in the 1919 World Series Black Sox scandal, they were found not guilty at trial. Or maybe the more accurate description is that the cases were dismissed. But that didn't matter because Kennesaw Mountain Landis, as baseball commissioner, he decided to ban the players for life. And shoeless Joe Jackson sits outside of Cooperstown to this day. And while Landis served as baseball commissioner, he didn't step down as a federal judge, at least at first. He served in both roles simultaneously. Conflict of interest, anyone? And eventually Landis resigned from his federal judge position in 1922. So Landis, another thing that um, I don't care particularly about him, he spent many years doing all he could behind the scenes to prohibit African-American players from playing in the major leagues even though he publicly stated the opposite. And it wasn't until after his death in 1944 that Jackie Robinson came around and broke the barrier with the Dodgers in 1947. So I certainly appreciate um, Kennesaw Mountain Landis's career, but I don't find the, uh, the man particularly noble trying to send congressmen to prison for writing editorials, uh, keeping races outside of professions, creating double jeopardy for individuals who are not found guilty in a court, but yet find themselves banned for life in their chosen profession. But it is what it is. That's history for you. So episode 163 is dedicated to the impactful, the varied, and the far from perfect career of Kennesaw Mountain Landis. So let's go from 4th of July and summer, um, activist judges who play fast and loose with the legal system that may result in trampling of individual rights, and shoeless Joe Jackson, at least with respect to shoes. I'll explain that in a minute. To make a connection to the main theme of this week's episode, it's one of the saddest and most outrageous chapters in American jurisprudence. And it's one that had tragic consequences and led to a reputational black eye for the United States globally. It happened in the summer of 1921, and very few people know of its existence today. But back then, Everyone in the United States and many across the globe were aware of our connection. It was the show murder trial and eventual wrongful execution of two Italian immigrants, Sacco and Vanzetti. Now, there was a shoe connection where it all started, my reference to Shoeless Joe. There was a robbery of the payroll cash for the employees of a shoe company just outside of Boston in the spring of 1920. And the employees who were transporting the payroll cash were summarily executed by the bandits, which wasn't an uncommon occurrence in the relatively violent United States of the early 1920s. Uh, 
But that robbery and the homicides, it resulted in what would become in many ways the trial of the century. Now, weeks after the killings, police were tipped off that two potential suspects to the crimes were on a streetcar. Cops boarded the streetcar and they detained two nervous looking Italians, Sacco and Vanzetti. They were carrying loaded handguns and they were carrying anarchist literature. And the literature is an important note because keep in mind, during the late 1910s and the 1920s, America was subjected to numerous bombings and terrorist acts by anarchists, sort of the Antifa back in the day. In fact, Kennesaw Mountain Landis himself was reportedly a mail bombing target that was foiled. Yet Sacco and Vanzetti, they had never been arrested for anything before. They had no history of violence. Um, there was no evidence su to uh, suggest that either man had been anywhere near the site of the murders during the time of the murders. Sacco had a good job and was a family man. Vanzetti struggled when he came to America, but after years of effort, he achieved success by starting a fish cart business that became quite profitable. And the two men knew each other, but they weren't particularly close friends. And between the two, Sacco came across as anything but an anarchist while Vanzetti was more of a thinker and clearly had anti-state views. But despite the lack of probable cause to the murders, law enforcement charged both men with homicide. Um, the nation's and law enforcement's panic over that nationwide bombing campaign that I just discussed by anarchists, it steamrolled due process in this case, and it steamrolled the individual rights of both Sacco and Vanzetti. Oh, and I need to bring up that there was no evidence, whether it be fingerprints or otherwise, that placed either accused at the scene of the crime. And it gets worse. When witnesses to the crime viewed lineups of potential suspects for identification, for some reason, both Sacco and Vanzetti were presented individually by themselves without the benefit of a lineup to the witnesses. And unbelievably, the police told the witnesses that these were the prime suspects before asking the witnesses whether they saw them at the scene of the crime or not. Now, neither man was fluent in English, having only the crudest ability to converse in it. But both during police questioning and during trial, questions were proffered in English and their responses were given in broken English, which was both difficult to understand and uh, was either lost or misconstrued during translation by those listening. The trial kicked off in the summer of 1921, went on for about seven weeks, and had thousands of pages of testimony. There were problems with the judge and the jury during the entire Sacco and Vanzetti trial, to say the least. Early in a trial, a jury foreman made the following comment, damn them, they ought to hang anyway. That's not good. The uh, trial was overseen by Judge Thayer. He was a disaster, procedurally and ethically. Um, towards the end of the trial, he lectured the jury on the concept of consciousness of guilt, which is basically the theory that innocent people don't need to fabricate answers or be evasive when answering questions from law enforcement or a trial, which was a nicely indirect way of telling the jury that Sacco and Vanzetti, they were guilty as hell. The jury ended up deliberating for a few hours. They returned a verdict of guilty for both men. The sentence was death by electrocution. The appeal process, it went on for several years, requests for retrials because of all the uh, transgressions and flaws from their arrest through their sentencing were submitted, but those requests were all denied. But there were signed petitions in support of the condemned men, including petitions that had the names of Albert Einstein on them, George Bernard Shaw, and H.G. Wells. Felix Frankfurter, who would eventually become a famous Supreme Court justice, he was then a very prominent professor at Harvard. He made a public campaign to denounce the way that Sacco and Vanzetti were subjected to a stacked and biased legal system. Check out this quote from Felix Frankfurter. I assert with deep regret, without the slightest fear of disproof, but certainly in modern times, Judge Thayer's opinion stands unmatched for discrepancies between what the record discloses and what the opinion conveys. His 25,000-word document cannot accurately be described otherwise than as a farrago of misquotations, misrepresentations, suppressions, and mutilations. The opinion is literally honeycombed with demonstrable errors, and a spirit alien to judicial utterance permeates the whole. Wow, that's one heck of a quote. 
the uh, governor of Massachusetts, Alan Fuller at the time, who had the ability to grant a stay of execution, was an interesting situation. He took a genuine interest in the case. He read transcript, he, uh, transcripts. He talked to jurors who sat on the case. He interviewed witnesses. And he spent a significant amount of time getting to know Sacco and Vanzetti in jail, along with their families when they are on death row. And he came to like both men personally, especially Vanzetti. But in the end, the governor begrudgingly refused to grant a stay of execution. He did, however, create a slight delay of a week or two to allow the Supreme Court to grant a retrial or hear new evidence. But the Supreme Court did not intervene. Thus, on the evening of August 22nd, 1927, the system was preparing to execute the men just after midnight, about six years after their trial. Sacco was executed first by electrocution. Vanzetti followed. Uh, Vanzetti did have a few last words to offer, uh, putting to work his better mastery of English that he developed by studying in prison while on death row. And here's a summary of his final words. I want to thank you for everything you have done for me, Warden. And then he turned to the witnesses and said, I wish to tell you that I am innocent and that I never committed any crime, but sometimes some sin. I thank you for everything you have done for me. I am innocent of all crime, not only of this, of all. I am an innocent man. I wish to forgive some people for what they are now doing to me. Those were Vanzetti's last words. He was then electrocuted to death. Um, By 1230 in the morning of August 23rd, the sad journey of Sacco and Vanzetti came to a tragic end. And Sacco and Vanzetti were officially executed for those murders involving the payroll robbery outside of Boston. But the real reason that Sacco and Vanzetti were killed was that they were guilty of being Italian at a time in America when that's all it took to be falsely accused and convicted of a crime and to die for it. That's just how it went back then, constant listeners. And the system, along with many Americans, frankly, during that era, they didn't consider immigrants like Italians as deserving of any individual rights. Most Italians in the 1910s and 1920s, they would be excluded from employment consideration and educational opportunities. Neighborhoods would put up restrictive covenants to keep them out. And in the South, it wasn't atypical to see the uh, Italians that they would have the option of attending black schools or no school at all. And I spoke about the language barrier that Sacco and Vanzetti suffered and how it contributed to their demise. The unwillingness of America to incorporate immigrants, particularly Italians, into society, they made it very difficult for the immigrant to develop fluent ability in English. It created a negative feedback loop whereby the broken English was then viewed either as an unwillingness to assimilate or as a sign of someone or some race not being intelligent. And here's what the New York Times, my favorite paper, not, said in an editorial back then. It is perhaps hopeless to think of civilizing the Italians or keeping them in order, except by the arm of the law. Yeah, that's from your New York Times. Yet another reason to disdain that overrated institution. So allow me to be specific as to why the Sacco and Vanzetti trial was a dark moment in American history. It wasn't because Sacco and Vanzetti were saints or that they weren't anarchists, um, because there is sufficient evidence that a reasonable person could assume that they were indeed anarchists and may have been guilty of not just sin, but perhaps crime through their lives. And I'm not even assuming that the men had no role in the holdup murders, whether it be of indirect nature or even directly. A reasonable person studying the evidence could easily conclude that they did indeed play some role. And a lot of experts spending careers studying the case came to that very conclusion decades after the trial. Those are not the key problems with this debacle. The problems were with respect to how the system went about treating Sacco and Vanzetti. They didn't receive fair and equal treatment under the law. In fact, the system went out of its way to prejudice both men. There was nothing in the evidence, or lack thereof, even close to approaching the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt when it came to the state prosecution's ability to present a compelling case for conviction. And I've provided a number of flaws from their arrest to the police custody handling to the trial and Judge Thayer with that kangaroo court, whereby any non-immigrant American at the time would have had the case against them immediately dismissed and thrown out of court. But these were immigrants. 
and the worst kind at the time, Italians. And bombing by anarchists were occurring all over the eastern United States and in major cities. Guilt by association, a different set of standards, rights, and protections than what the Constitution prescribed. All of it executed and sanctioned by the system itself. Shameful. Now, learning about Sacco's and Vanzetti's plight was a big motivator in developing my views on the death penalty through the years. Because a rules-based individual, through the years, I've always been a supporter of the death penalty, even though I'm also a big supporter of individual rights. I didn't see a conflict between those two. And my view was that if you impede the individual rights of another to the point where you take their life, well, then by golly, you need to pay a similar price. Eye for an eye, so to speak. I guess I had a little bit of both Old and New Testament in me, and maybe we all do at different times in our lives. But then cases like Sacco and Vanzetti, they got me thinking and reconsidering my position on the death penalty, because we know even the best designed legal systems, including in the United States, they can be corrupted or subjected to impure biases from time to time, or maybe often. And when dealing with capital punishment, you can't afford to be wrong if you want to call yourself a civil society that respects the sanctity of the individual and one where you are presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And you can be wrong one of three ways. One way is via the Sacco and Vanzetti route, where the system simply fails and chooses not to function in a fair manner. The system goal seeks for a conviction and just goes through the motions justifying what it's already predetermined to deliver. The second way to go wrong is where the system might work flawlessly, but guilt under beyond a reasonable doubt standard still leaves a level of subjectivity and judgment to the jurors. If they convict a thousand defendants of first degree murder and the state executes all 1,000, what if the jury's accuracy rate of an actual guilt level is as good as, say, 95 percent? Well, that means you still would have killed 50 innocent people. And the third way to go wrong is sort of related to the second way that we just discussed, which is having the benefit of advanced technology or basically new evidence over time, whether we see it in the form of forensics or DNA evidence, and that new evidence exonerates those accused of heinous crimes in the past. But if we already hung them or electrocuted them to death, then what? I'd rather go the route of life imprisonment without parole upon conviction for first-degree murder unless the accused confesses to the murder, in which case um, you can execute with a clean conscience. It's not exactly an eye for an eye, I accept that, but it's close, and it at least keeps the wrongly convicted from being murdered for a murder that they didn't commit. Now, I mentioned earlier that Sacco and Vanzetti hurt America's reputation across the globe. Once Sacco and Vanzetti were dead, protests broke out in Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Berlin, Sydney, Hamburg, Geneva, Tokyo, and Copenhagen. And many of the demonstrations were violent, or what the media these days sometimes would call mostly peaceful. Hyde Park in London saw brawls between protesters and police. Dozens were injured there, um, some seriously. In Cuba, the U.S. Embassy was bombed. And then in Geneva, the League of Nations was attacked. In Paris residents, this was interesting, I didn't realize this uh, about the level of anti-Americanism in France at the time, but in Paris, right after the execution, residents, Parisians were roaming the streets looking for Americans to assault. And American hotels and theaters that played American films were attacked all across Europe. Interestingly, I, I came across this, the mayor of New York was on a goodwill tour of Germany when the executions of Sacco and Vanzetti occurred in the United States, and he ended up being threatened with physical violence in Berlin. That's what you call bad timing. And all of this um, global post-execution violence against America was preceded from 1921 when Sacco and Vanzetti were first put on trial through 1927 at the time of their execution. So you had years that preceded this where dozens of incidents of protest, bombings, attacks, inside and outside the United States were occurring on their behalf. So the world took an objective look that uh, America's supposed and self-described system of fair justice, what it really looked like, and the world didn't like what it saw at all. So think about it, constant listeners. In the summer of 1927, 
just after the Sacco and Vanzetti executions, it wasn't safe to be an American beyond the borders of the United States. Let's conclude this episode by making a connection to a more positive note of hope when it comes to the United States. Talk about juxtaposition. But around the same time in the summer of 1927, as Sacco and Vanzetti were being readied for execution, under conditions that were less than ideal when it comes to American justice, the nation saw the dedication of Mount Rushmore, featuring faces that epitomized the ideals of American Republican democracy. Again, an interesting juxtaposition. Now, each face on the mountain is 60 plus foot high. Each nose is 20 foot long. Um, Jefferson's nose developed a crack when it was being um, sort of created. So the face had to be reset at a different angle farther into the stone. And the directional stairs and locations of the four presidents, those were dictated by the geology of the stone on the face of the mountain. But even Rushmore wasn't entirely pure with American ideals. You see, it took 14 years to complete the job, but only seven years of actual work. The difference being delays and halting of work due to insufficient funding. Some things never change with government. And Teddy Roosevelt, by the way, why is he up there? Well, he was chosen to be one of the four, not because of his virtue or contributions, but because he was friends with the architect and builder of Rushmore, Gutsan Borsham. Once again, the system favored the connected. Happy Fourth of July, everyone. Stay connected to the far middle. <laughs>